Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today I am thrilled to have Liz Wiseman joining us. Liz, welcome. Oh Michael, it's good It's good to be here. So Liz, uh, you are the author of uh, a fantastic book called Multipliers, as well as several other titles. Uh, you've worked with clients like Nike, Salesforce, 3M, Target, you know, the list goes on, uh, many top global brands um, really focusing on creating a better workplace. Mm. And I know that you got your start um, well, at least 17 years at Oracle before you went out and started your, your own company. And I've heard you you talk on other podcasts or just publicly that you know your experience at Oracle was, was a positive one, uh, mm. that you learned a lot from it. But I'm wondering, what was maybe one thing that uh, that big company experience didn't prepare you for or didn't kind of give you that you realized when you started your own company? Oh, oh, well, you know, it did not prepare me to be a solo decision maker. And I remember when I left Oracle and I wanted to start a consulting practice and, you know, my plan was to hang up a shingle, as they say, and say, hey, you know, I'm available to do this kind of work. And I remember creating a website. It was a basic website, probably like a lot of consultants have when they start out. And I'm choosing colors. <laughs> and I remember stopping and thinking, okay, who do I need to ask for permission to use this shade of blue? And 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 I'm and I literally it was this knee-jerk reaction of, oh, I am not empowered to make brand decisions. I had worked for a large corporation that you didn't change Oracle Red. Mm -hmm. Because you liked it a little bluer or pinker, like there was Oracle Red. And um, and I remember feeling kind of disabled to make some of those decisions because I had been so used to collaborating or going like to the approved source for things. And so I struggled initially, like, oh, wait a minute. I guess I'm the decision maker. Right. And, and that was something I was ill prepared for at first. I think like deep down inside, you know, I just channeled my inner bossy know-it-all. I've got this. Um, but it was hard at first. Do, do you think that, that all the responsibility, all the decision rights on yeah. everything? Right. Do, do you think that causes kind of like you know analysis paralysis for for people where now because you are the decision maker for pretty much everything, especially at the early stages, that you tend to overthink or procrastinate or just spend too much time on little things that may not necessarily move the business forward? Mm. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I think so, but I think both extremes are damaging. One is mm. to overthink uh, constantly. The other is to underthink and just say, okay, I'm the decision maker. And in some ways, like once I figured out I was in charge, I'm like, yeah. I like being in charge. And, and so you can go out, but there's a reason why you know, you consult other people about things out of your expertise. Mm -hmm. And what I had to learn was that sweet spot of, wait a minute, you're now doing things you don't know how to do. Who are the people, like you used to know who they were in a big organization, but who are the people, whether they're professional attorneys, accountants, or friends and family that you should pause and say, what do you think of this? Like, give me some feedback on it. Um, because there aren't that many jobs that are best done with a single brain. Mm, yeah, I think that's very well said. So you left Oracle and uh, in 2010, you started Wiseman Group, uh, which I believe is the same year that you published Multipliers, if I'm if I'm not correct, or sorry, say if I'm not mistaken. Um, hopefully I'm correct on, on that. Um, did the company come first? Did the book come first? Like, what, what, what did that kind of launch or launching pad look like for both the business and the book? Well, when I left Oracle in 2005, I started a consulting practice, hung up a shingle, called it Mindshare Learning mm. Systems, and did some um, executive coaching, did some strategy work, which was kind of an extension of the work I had learned to do at Oracle. And, you know, I had a range of things that I was available to do. And I was, you know, I was pretty good at about two, three, four, maybe a half a dozen things that I would say yes to these projects. Well, then I did the research behind multipliers, wrote that book, and we ended up renaming the company to the Wiseman Group 
in anticipation of this book launch. And it was there that we went from, or I went from being kind of a consultant for hire and a range of things to finding out like the market actually wanted one thing from me Mm. more than any other thing. And that was like helping managers learn how to be better leaders and doing it with this multipliers framework. So I started to shed a lot of the small to medium sized projects and skills and really put all of my energy behind what I was getting this resounding feedback from the market is you have something that we want and, you know, moved more towards productizing that. What what did that look like? So, I mean, uh that feeling or, or I guess what, what were you actually seeing to, to make the decision to really narrow in and specialize? And as you said, productize and build around that. Cause oftentimes people have a lot of experience. They have a lot of expertise. They're offering a whole bunch of different services. Uh, and if they do an analysis, they might find that the majority of their, their, you know, revenue or profit comes from like one specific offering. But in your case, you're, you're saying the marketplace was really telling you, can you give a little bit more detail around, was it just people saying, hey, like, this is what we want? Or what was actually going on that helped you to make that decision to go all in on that one area? Well, the book was getting traction. And when I wrote this book, you know, I I hoped that more than a couple dozen people would read the book. I'm like, <laughs> gee, I hope someone other than my mom reads this book. And I had a sense that people tech executives and managers and corporate leaders would appreciate the book. So I figured it would get some traction in Silicon Valley where Mm. I have like lived and worked um, the majority of my life. But then it started to get traction like in healthcare and people from healthcare and doctors were calling. And I'm like, I don't know a thing about healthcare. And then school systems are calling and then hospitality companies and manufacturing and not just in the US. And so I'm finding that the idea was resonating around the world. And so Mm -hmm. the first, I think, feedback I got was this idea that's captured in this book. And, And that idea, simply put, is that the way a leader uses his or her own intelligence and know-how and capability really affects the intelligence and know-how and capability of their team. And a leader can either have an amplifying or a multiplying effect on their team. You know, they're leaders who deeply use people's intelligence and people get smarter and more capable around them, or a leader can have a diminishing effect. And that there are a lot of people who are having a diminishing effect, totally unaware of this. And I call them the accidental diminishers. Well, the idea just started to get traction. So the book is now like not just having that initial success from its launch, but it's um, what did Harper Collins called it? They, they would refer to it as the little book that could, that, you know, it just kept getting momentum. And were you finding that it was getting more momentum even without you, like without you working as hard or trying to like, so you weren't necessarily pushing it, but it was being, it was kind of pulling or it was, it was creating results even without your direct support and and ongoing promotion of the book. Absolutely. And I'm someone, and this is probably because I was raised at Oracle. Like I'm someone who knows how to push a boulder up a hill. Like (laughs) I, you know, like I've got a pretty strong work ethic and definitely a can do make things happen work approach. So I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me, let me, you know, get a book written. Let me, you know, get a book contract. Let me make that happen. And then suddenly I'm finding that I'm not having to effort things. And mm-hmm. I remember when people would come to me and say, I I read your book multipliers. And I'm like, no, you didn't <laughs> because I don't know you. Like, how is it that you've read the book and you're not an Oracle alumni or someone I coached or someone that, you know, came from a company like Apple or SAP that I had done a lot of work. I'm like, we're not related. So how is it that you know about this book? Cause I had of course made all my friends and family read the book. Sure. And so I'm getting that over and over. Like there's something happening word of mouth. There's a referencing thing. There's a value that's strong enough that other people are sharing it unprompted by a social media post, a tweet, or what have you. And that's where I'm seeing, oh, okay, there's there's something here. So the first feedback I got from the market was this idea is valuable. 
and we want more of it. And then the second thing that I got was, and the way that you're presenting it to us really works. And that's where like all the other types of consulting, that was like the sum total of years of experience of how I worked at Oracle and mm-hmm. how I was coaching, but the way that I was finding um, how to teach the idea, how to speak about yeah. it, how to how to share it in a way that um, really connected. Can with you people. talk, yeah, a little bit more about that? Because I'm I'm wondering, you know, now that the book has been around for for quite some time, right? It's really taken on kind of a life of its own and, and made a, a big impact on so many people to the point that you've followed on with with other books. Um, you mentioned, you know, the way that you presented it. And I feel like there's, you know, research was a big part of of this book, but I'm wondering when you look at it now, kind of in in hindsight, what do you think made the book so powerful, so effective, so compelling uh, to reach that level of of success? You know, the way you presented it, the idea, just talk a little bit bit more about that, because I'm thinking about everyone who's tuning in and, you know, what lesson there might be inside of that, that they might be able to use in, with their own intellectual property or their, their next book or whatever they're working on. Absolutely. Well, I, the, the term that I use, I certainly didn't invent this term, but just the term I use to think about this is signature experience. Now, maybe I did invent that. I don't know who else uses that term, but I, I'm sure, I'm pretty convinced I didn't invent this. Like someone else must talk about this is I think about it as like, what is somebody's signature experience? Mm -hmm. And I feel like I developed a signature experience, which is if you come to any one of our programs, whether it's a keynote, whether, you know, it's a a seminar, a workshop, a coaching session, like it's going to have certain very predictable elements. And if it doesn't, I've failed to do my job and my Mm -hmm. team has failed to do our job, but you know, it's going to be thought provoking. And I started to pick up on this. Like, I remember this moment and I was teaching a class at Genentech slash Roche. And there was this Roche executive. He was a, you know, scientist. He, um, you know, he's in the session and, you know, there's a lot of Europeans in the session because there's a lot of Roche executives. And I'm always, as an American, I'm always nervous running seminars for Europeans because they, they experience learning in different ways. Like they- sure interact with classes and workshops and presentations in different ways in America. They don't hoop and holler. They're not like, Whoa, this is great. You know, they don't react to this way. Canadians may be somewhere in between. I don't know, <laughs> but you know, he's kind of just stoic and just looking at me and he comes up afterwards and I'm like, Oh, this is the part where he tells me like, this is, you know, wrong. Or And he says, you know, I've been, and I think he was Swiss. Um, he, he said, I've been managing for 25 years. And in this last hour, you've caused me to completely rethink what it means to be a good leader. He mm-hmm. said, 25 years of experience. I am now questioning everything I thought I knew as a leader. Because he thought that, you know, leaders who use their intelligence in a way that sort of inspired other people, like we're strong, we're capable. And and now I'm saying, you know, that that actually might be having a diminishing effect. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this has fundamentally changed my worldview. And and that's kind of this first thing I noticed is people would say, wow, that that messed with my mind. Right. So thought that, provoking, you get them to think, you challenge maybe their assumptions or or prior beliefs. Yeah. And so that's like the first thing is it needs to be thought provoking. Someone's, you know, if it's just like, oh, yeah, I kind of know this. I'm going to stay away from that territory. I'm going to look at what can we do that will cause us to rethink and sometimes deeply, deeply read in ways that are often unsettling. And I still today get this feedback from the book. People that I read your book, that was painful. I hear that a lot. People say it was painful. And I'm like, like painful is in bad book. They're like, well, no (laughs) painful as in uh, occasionally some people will say bad book. Like I get those reviews on Amazon every now and then. But it's like, no, like that really made me question myself. Mm-hmm. And in some ways it made me feel a little bit, a little bit bad about how I've been operating as a leader, but then it kind of left me hopeful. So that's like the first is um, thought provoking and, and a kind of an element of that is everything 
I try to do is evidence-based. Like I'm not making stuff up. Like I'm going to research things really diligently. And that's what creates that thought provoking. Right. You know, the second thing is relevant to practical. It's like everyone should walk away with something very specific. And Mm -hmm. this has become part of this signature. And I hear it over and over. People are like, wow, that messed with my mind. But I felt like I walked away knowing exactly what I needed to go do. So I call it top and tail. You know, it's like, you know, you kind of like top level thinking, but then like something very specific on the ground. Um, And then the third part of that signature experience is like fun and funny. And if people aren't having fun, um, you know, it's, it's, we shouldn't be doing it. And I really have this deep belief that when learning is lighthearted, we actually can open ourselves up to like deep learning. I found it very interesting as you're explaining these three things, because as I think to my time reading uh, multipliers, I got those three things. There was a lot of, a lot of elements of, whoa, like that's, you know, you're provoking my thoughts. Like I, I didn't know that or kind of challenging, you know, my, my prior beliefs or, or views. Uh, it was light in, in the sense that it was easy to read. It wasn't <clears throat> like a dry, you know, textbook or, or like too heavy with research or data. Um, but the, the research and data was, was there. And then the, there was a lot of very practical, easy to implement, like clear. Okay. I know I want to test this. I'm going to, I've already been using it. Right. So, um, so I see that I appreciate you kind of breaking that down. Cause now I have a different perspective on that. I think that'll be very applicable for many people. You talk about, so research obviously is, is very important to all of your work and, and especially this book. Um, many people, you know, see the value in doing research, but they don't feel like they have the time to do research. Um, so take me back to that point where you're running this other consulting business that you had. Um, you're working with clients you're doing a whole bunch of research. And I know you had a research um, associate or assistant, Greg McEwen, who's gone on to do a whole bunch of stuff as well. Um, but how how would you kind of counsel or advise somebody who is busy with life and busy with business, uh, but they want to work on a book or they want to just dive deeper into research, but they may not feel like they have the time to really do thoughtful research. What have you learned around that? And what might you suggest? Oh, well, I, I air towards do the research, do the research. I mean, like I, and I think I do it to to me, it's a lazy strategy. I know a lot of people look at that and go, wow, rigorous research. I don't have time for that. Mm, I don't have the energy for that. And I look at it as I don't have the energy to not do that. Mm, Because what what I mean, well, when you've done the research and I've done, you know, rigorous research for all my books uh, that usually involves on the the shorter end, like three months of intensive research and then three months of sense-making and analysis in that research. And then probably another three plus months of model building, but that can be even longer than that. Um, So that's a huge time investment and nobody pays you to do this. Um, Like it's all Um, Mm self-funded. But I look at that and go, I would much rather invest my time doing that and then come out of it confident in the product. Mm -hmm. And so when you're standing in front of a group of people and someone says, no, I don't think so. Like the world doesn't work this way. You can sit back and listen and hear their point of view and help them move forward from that point of view without getting defensive. Mm-hmm. Because I look at them and go, man, you can you can sling any arrows you want at me and my work. And I just don't worry because I'm like, you know what? The evidence doesn't lie. It doesn't make it like right. I didn't make this up. Like this is really how people think and work. This is really what leaders do mm. have a diminishing effect. So when somebody's getting really defensive, I don't have a panic moment. And, and to me, like once you stand on a platform of truth, then everything else is easy. Yeah. You know, you don't waste any cycles trying to like make stuff up or create proof points or extensive case studies. Cause it's like, we've done that work. It's foundational. And how do you manage your, your schedule during that time? So whether it's, you know, writing multipliers or any of your, your other books, are you carving out? just time every morning? Are you taking chunks of time 
like out of the business? How are you actually structuring that or what have you found works best for you? And I know that it's different for different people, but in your case, how do you kind of navigate that? Okay. Well, I want to give credit to luck uh, to some of it. So when the first book multipliers, uh, a lot of it was luck. And part of it was um, I happened to just be starting this research as the 2008 global economic crisis was unfolding. And I remember getting the call, SAP was one of them. And they're like, hey, you know, Liz, we're going to take our business with you down to zero. And I think it was doing like, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of business with that company. And they're like, well, we're not cutting it by a little, we're going to take it to zero. And so I had a lot of client driven business just dry up, which is, is a hardship financially, but it was a blessing on the calendar, which is like, yeah. great. I'm actually starting this big research project. Now I can devote myself entirely to it. And, you know, a lot of I, I was fortunate to, when I left Oracle, I left with enough of, you know, an equity position in that company and a nest egg that, you know, my husband and I had set aside ample money for this. And so I wasn't in that monthly cycle right. of no stress around finances at that time. Yeah. And I don't need to describe that because everyone knows what that sure. feels like. And so I was able to make like a multi-year investment mm -hmm. in something. So I can't give myself a lot of credit other than, you know, I probably stayed at Oracle just a tad longer than I should have emotionally, but I, you know, financially, I, I wanted to leave when I was in a really strong position to be able to start this company and be able to do the work that um, I wanted to do. So that's easy to say it's hard for someone to replicate that. I realize that. But with every subsequent piece of research, um, you know, this, the kind of work we do operates very much like a pharmaceutical model where nobody pays. And that's where everyone's like, oh, the drug, how could that possibly cost $50 a pill or $200 for a month supply with these just, and people look at the little pill and go, I know it only costs you 25 cents to manufacture that mm -hmm. or $12 <clears throat> or what have you. Uh, but there's 10 years of R and D work that leads up to that. And a book is very much this way. There's yeah. You know, all this unpaid investment in knowledge and IP and, um, <clears throat> you know, that then gets recovered with workshop fees, sure. you know, et, et cetera. So that, I think I was kind of a little bit smart about how to right. manage that and how to recoup that investment and then continue to deliver the value in all the work around the book mm -hmm. and funds the next piece of research. So if I'm hearing you correctly, I mean, during the writing of multipliers, you had the time because all of a sudden business that you had start to kind of dry up in, in more recent books. Uh, are you just taking time off? Or are you like, how do you fit the actual writing of the book in? Well, I, I do. Um, I probably practice, um, I'm sure someone's put a better name to this, but it's that like time and horizon striping, which is I try at any given time to be spending some of my time doing immediate, you know, probably what would be revenue producing work, you right. know, doing some things that are mid range projects that don't deliver value or revenue in the sh immediate term, mm -hmm. but you know, are like midterm investments. And then I try to have a stripe of my time dedicated to something that's not going to bear fruit for years to come. Right. And <clears throat> I try to generally stripe my time that way. And of course, there's a stripe in there for doing work that contributes to your community or a profession that brings you no sure. revenue, credit, Got it. Okay. Know, anything like that. Like I, I believe very you know importantly that a big stripe of um, my time should be spent doing that. Um, but then when I go into book mode, big research project, and, you know, of course, I realize not everyone listening is involved in book work, but most everyone has something where there's a product they're investing in. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to enrich our products and services and make this kind of R&D kind of investment. Then I'll, I'll heavily skew it where I'll block out entire days, entire weeks, and we'll leave in little bits for that kind of revenue producing work. 
but then I go into, um, oh, I don't know. It's, I wouldn't call it, selfish is probably not the right word, but I'll go into, I call it lockdown mode and right. I lock down my schedule and I say no to everything that isn't essential short-term like revenue producing work, okay. like fulfilling commitments to clients and everything else is R and D book related. And I just say no to like, Oh, I'd love to have lunch with you, but no, I'd love to be on uh, this. No, that's helpful. Cause yeah, I think it's, you know, to, to see that perspective that when you're focused on something very important that you, you know, is going to take focus time, you, you have to say no to a lot of things to, um, to give it the time that it, that it needs and the attention that it needs. I want to get into the book uh, in in a little bit more detail because there's there's so much inside of it that I think people will will really benefit from. One of the kind of the core themes inside of the book is you have multipliers, right? So who kind of who leaders who um, amplify the intelligence, right, or um, kind of support their their team, and then you have diminishers, people that kind of drain the intelligence or drain the energy, right, of of those around them. And That's the life out of teams and organizations. There we go. Okay, you, you said it. Most you, you people said, experience it. Like, right. oh, they were like soul crushing. Right, okay. And so the multipliers, the, the, those leaders that amplify that energy and intelligence and so forth uh, of their team and the team loves to be around, one of the, the big ideas behind that is that a multiplier will ask questions of the team. They're not just telling them what to do. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Just kind of set the stage for people so they really understand who a multiplier is. And then I want to get into a few questions uh, to try and make this a little bit more specific to the world of consulting. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> we found that there's a number of things that multipliers and diminishers do very differently. It begins with their core assumption, like what they kind of walk in telling themselves when they walk mm -hmm. into a meeting or just walk through the threshold of the office and start a day. And that's you know, diminishers are tend to be operating from this belief that no one's going to figure it out without me, which means it puts them in this mode of, you know, hiring smart people, but then telling them what to do, giving answers, making decisions, micromanaging, getting it done. Like they're very hands-on and prescriptive. You know, they they operate primarily from a place of knowledge certainty and they direct other people and I have lots of days where I'm <laughs> working this way like I fall into this pattern a lot particularly when you know I lead an organization that's based on like knowledge and intellectual property and it's pretty easy to be like okay I have answers let me tell you what to do I've done this yeah, right but we find that multipliers they're operating from this belief that you know what the people that I lead, the people I work with are smart and can figure this out. Mm -hmm. In essence, a lot of people are familiar, Michael, with this idea of a growth mindset, you know, that Carol sure. Dweck, um, introduced. But it's, um, and this was, I think, Carol's observation about multipliers. She says, oh yeah, it's like you've taken this concept of growth mindset and looked at what does that look like in the work world? And what does that look like when leaders hold that belief not about themselves, but about the people they work with. Mm. So it's one thing to th say like, okay, you know what? I'm capable of learning. I could figure out harder things. I may not have all the answers, but I can figure things out. That's a growth mindset. Right. That one's intelligence isn't fixed or finite. And, and do you find it, is this different? Is the application of this idea of, you know, asking questions rather than just giving direction, but, you know, asking questions as a multiplier would, would do, is it different? different based on the size of the, of the company. So let's say in a large organization, you have a lot more people, maybe you have people that have even more experience, but if you have a smaller company, you have five people, you have 10 people, you have whatever that might be. Have you seen anything in the research or just in your own experience and observation uh, and working with clients? Is, is it different, the application of that in a smaller company? You know, I haven't seen that it's different in a smaller company, but it does, it does, pose particular challenges when your company's product is a person's knowledge, mm. which most consulting companies, like that dynamic comes into play. But let me, let me kind of go back to what you said is like the multiplier leaders are leading through inquiry. Right. So instead of telling people what to do, yep. they're pointing people in the right direction and then asking people 
really good questions there. Instead of giving people directives, they give people problems to solve. Mm. So rather than, hey, I want you to write uh, a white paper that will, you know, we can publish next month. It would be more like, okay, you know, what kind of paper do we need to write that would reach the right audience and and communicate this idea in a compelling way? Mm. So it's not like, hey, knock yourself out. It's not like a hippie form of leadership of like, I don't know, do what you want. Like be creative, make something, do something valuable for our clients. It's it's kind of being prescriptive about what you want people to think about. Right. But being a little open about how people go about thinking. So you're asking a question, but the question has some guardrails or you're kind of giving direction within the question, but it's still a question. Is kind of what I'm what I'm hearing you say. You're right in terms of like the writing a white paper. You're not just saying, "Hey, like let's let's get some publicity or let's just create something." You're saying, "Hey, if we were to create a white paper, how could we structure it so that it would have the most impact or something yeah. along those lines?" It's asking the questions that focus the intelligence and energy mm-hmm. of the team on the right problem. Okay, you know, it's asking questions that shift the burden of thinking from mm-hmm. you as maybe the proprietor of the business right. and and share that burden with your team. And, and Michael, I want to give you my favorite example Please. of this. It comes from a movie scene and it's a movie scene that most of us have seen. And it is from um, the uh, American NASA program. And it's the movie's Apollo 13. Now, have you seen it? I have, yeah. Okay. So there's some really memorable scenes from this movie. And um the one that I'm thinking of is so, so like, here's the plot of the movie is, you know, NASA's trying to send a manned, uh, you know, spaceship up to the moon um, and things have gone wrong. And now they're just trying to get the astronauts back to earth. So lunar landing is not possible. They're trying to get them back. The, the, the module, the capsule that they're in is now filling up with poisonous gas. Now, Michael, do you know the scene that I'm talking about? I, I have a memory of it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. there. And I bet a lot of people listening have a visual memory mm. of this because here's the scene. So the engineering manager, he calls his team together and he he dumps a box full of parts onto a table. And these are parts like a space suit and hoses and a bunch of stuff and he just dumps this on the table and what he says is hey the guys upstairs have handed us this one and we have to come through because this this capsule's filling up with poisonous gas mm-hmm. and he says we have to make um we have to find a way to make like the hole for this fit into the hole for that using nothing but this mm-hmm. and it's kind of this square peg round hole kind of problem because these two things don't naturally come together, but they've now got to figure out a way to, and he says, okay, let's build a filter. And I think it's such a great visual of what managers can do. It's just like, Hey, how do we solve this problem? We didn't create it. How do we solve it with nothing but these resources? And essentially what this engineering manager is doing is giving his team a puzzle to solve. It's like, hey, how do we increase our market share in this space with no new products by the end of the quarter while not having any deterioration in our customer satisfaction in this other segment of our business? How do we do that? So there's lots of um, guidance built into the question. Liz, so let me ask you this because uh, one of the advantages that smaller companies have is that they're, they're more nimble. They can move very quickly. Uh, what about in the situation where where the leader or the owner of the business uh, who does in this, let's say, in this kind of hypothetical situation, they, they know the most about the market or about the clients or about whatever. How should somebody think about if they know what, let's say they believe they know what needs to be done, um, how do they how should they think about that in terms of giving direction or guidance to team members? Like, so if they know what they they believe they know what they need to do, but yet they're trying to be a multiplier, not a diminisher. Is there ever a time where a leader should say, hey, here's what we need done or here's what I need you to do. You know, can you please get that done? Or have you found that even in those situations, it's still not a good idea to do that. And rather the, the, the multiplier leader should always 
be asking questions? How do you mm-hmm. think about that? Well, here's what I would suggest is that a good leader should try to lead by asking questions as much as possible. Mm. Now, I have a little exercise that I um, like to give people as a challenge, the extreme question challenge. We can come back to that in a moment. But there's a couple places. So I would say push yourself everywhere you can to try to help guide your firm, guide your team by asking good questions rather than give answers. Mm -hmm. So make that the rule rather than the exception. Now, there are a couple notable exceptions. The first of which is if you've already made up your mind about what you want done and how you want it done, then you should just tell people and not practice like faux participation. Mm. You know, like, um, you know, I used to complain that my husband on Friday nights would say, we'd always take the kids out to dinner. He's like, hey, Liz, where do you want to go for dinner? And I'd be like, well, you know, I was thinking maybe we could go to Chevy's or here. Or this, And he was like, yeah, I was thinking maybe Thai food. And I'm like, you already knew it was Thai food before you asked me. <laughs> but he was trying to be like, I don't know, good husbandly or trying to, I mean, right. he knows what his wife does, you know, for yeah. a living. Like sure, he sure. understands these principles. And so he was practicing faux participation. I'm like, Larry, if you if you already know you want to go to Thai food, you just say, hey, babe, let's go to Thai food. And right. I, because they're like, don't insult me with the question. I've done that so many times mm. myself. And one time one of my kids busted me when I was like walking outside with my young son. It was like, I don't know, probably eight, nine or 10. And we've I've got lunch and he and I are going to eat lunch outside. And I'm like, hey, Josh, you know, do you want to eat you know, they're at the the table or over by the fire pit. And I'm walking to the fire pit to sit out the tray. And he goes, well, mom, it looks like you've already decided <laughs> we're eating at the fire pit. So let's, so why did you ask? I think it's really easy to get into that trap. Yeah, sure. Like if you already know it's Thai food, just say, you know what, we're, let's go to Thai food. But that's helpful. Yeah. The second is, you know, in times of crisis, there, these may not be multiplier moments. Now I get a lot of people who push back on me and say, no, you can be a multiplier even in times of crisis. But um, let me share an experience I had. Uh, this was um, off at the Yale Medical School and then Yale New Haven Hospital chain there. You know, this is like a quadrary, you know, academic medical center. And I'm doing a class on multipliers for all the physician leaders. So they're the people who lead all the residency programs and and we're having a great time and they're loving multipliers. And then we break for lunch and then suddenly they're not loving multipliers again. You know, they come back and there's like a mutiny and they're like, yeah, we get it. We want to be a multiplier, but you know, maybe you don't understand what we do is like <laughs> we, we deal with life and death moments. Like we hold people's life in our hands. Like, you know, when someone's flatlining in the OR, this is not necessarily a mul- this isn't a multiplier moment. Right. And then they describe what they maybe have to do. And they're like, we, we, we not only tell people what to do, we yell, like we scream. Like, and fortunately, I had the sense to ask a question. And I said, Well, I get it. What percentage of the time are you dealing with those life and death kind of moments? Mm. And they said, they they conferred amongst themselves and they're like, probably three to five percent of our time Mm. like well in those three to five percent moments i recommend you yell (laughs) tell people what to do like if it were my child on that operating table i would want you to do whatever it took to save that child's life i mean short of something horribly abusive uh But what about the other 95 to 90 Mm percent, 97 percent of your time? Like, how do you need to lead then? Mm -hmm. And like, what happens if you lead in the same way in those moments that you're telling everyone to do? Like you're treating everything like these high stakes moments. This is a group of people who are, you know, surgeons. And I had that same conversation with a group of military officers. They said two to three percent of their time or life or death moments. It's really interesting. That, yeah. If I think if you would ask just people uh, more generally, they probably initially would think it's a much higher percentage, but if you give some real thought to it, it's probably, as you said, you know, a much smaller percentage of, of time. Um, that's really helpful. I appreciate you kind of 
presenting it that way. Uh, one question I know that comes up a lot with, uh, with people is how to get the most out of their team. Mm. Um, and so I think you talk about in the book, there's this idea of like the, the liberator. Um, so it's how do you right, kind of uh, generate pressure, but not stress. So m- my question is really, how can you get the most out of your team, right? Maybe applying pressure because you want them to do their, their best. You want to challenge them. You want them to feel proud of what they're accomplishing, uh, but without creating stress or overwhelm or burnout or, you know, mutiny. So what are some of the, the best practices around that? Oh, well, let me start with the principle on this is like, what's the difference between working in a tense environment versus an intense environment? Mm. You know, what's the difference between pressure and stress? You know, some pressure is good. Stress tends to cause us to shut down. Mm -hmm. And um, the best way this was explained to me was one of the multipliers I interviewed. He, he made reference to the William Tell story with, okay, we're now back to another Swiss um, example here. Uh, and and he said, you know, the story of William Tell, the famed Swiss archer who has to shoot, you know, an oh, apple yeah. off the head of his son. And he said, in that scenario, you know, William Tell feels pressure. His son feels stress. Mm. And, and the difference is control. And, you know, if you, if you put pressure on people to do like their best work, but you don't give them control they're just in an environment of stress mm. like if you, Can want- you make that uh, sorry to interrupt Could you make that a little bit more granular for for those who are joining us how how just maybe a bit tactical what can they do to to challenge or to apply that pressure to their team without stressing them out like i'm wondering are there certain expectations that need to be set do they have to have a certain kind of conversation how do you put that in, into practice well to put it into practice what you want to do is give people two things uh, you want to give people ownership, meaning control over the, their work. And then you want to hold people accountable to that. See, the control keeps it from being debilitating stress. Um, the ownership is what applies the pressure. And let me give you a very concrete example. This is one of my favorite examples. It's not Swiss. Um, this comes from John Chambers. He, uh, at the time, is a new CEO at Cisco. This is a networking router company. And he's making his first executive hire. He's hiring a man named Doug. And uh, Doug said to me when Chambers hired him, so Doug's going to run customer support. And and Chambers said to him, Doug, when it comes to this part of the business, you get 51% of the vote. And 100% of the accountability. Mm. Now, this is the best shorthand I know for giving someone ownership and accountability. Because what he's saying is you get 51% of the vote, meaning you have final decision rights. You're in charge. You know, you get to like make the decisions like this is yours to be in charge of you, Doug, not I am in charge. See, a lot of managers tell other people they're in charge, but they don't let go of, of ownership. It's kind of like, and the metaphor I love to think about is the like transferring title. When you buy a house, mm-hmm. the previous owner has to relinquish title before you can take title right. of that house. And a lot of bosses don't relinquish title. They never sign away title. They're like, oh, here, you own it, but I own it too. And, and why is that? Is that because they're, the they're scared of, of things going wrong or a non-optimal result? Or like what's what's holding people back from letting go? Well, I think a couple things. One, they're scared that people are going to fail, which means you haven't sized the task right. Mm, would, what, what do you I, mean by that? Tell me about that. Yeah. I would much rather see business owners. And I'm a business owner of a small team too. So I kind of like know this feeling of like, I want someone else to own it. But like in the end, I'm the one who pays the price. Right. I would much rather see people give someone 51% of the vote on something small like on this report, Mm. on this meeting, on this service delivery, on this client interaction, like rather than, hey, welcome to the team, you own it. Right. Like act like an owner. It's like, no, give someone small, something that if they screw it up, like you, you can recover from this. They can recover. Give someone, like he didn't say, hey, Doug, you know, welcome to Cisco. You get 51% of the vote around here. No, you don't, you know. 
give someone something small and as they prove themselves mm. let that let that grow so that you always feel like it's incremental trust being built there second is i wouldn't give someone 100% of the ownership so what was brilliant about what chambers does is he gives them 51 which means chambers holds 49 meaning consult me <laughs> I've got an opinion on this. Listen to me. Keep me informed. Consult with your colleagues. Play as a team. But in the end, we're going to back you on the decision you make on this. I think the other reason why people don't give people full ownership is they're in this like um, collaboration mismatch, which is like, hey, we're all going to like be in this together. And I really am not a fan of jointly held ownership. Right. Like, I love collaboration, but I want to know of the five people working on this project, who Who's, owns it? Yeah, right. Some people call this one throat to choke, whose neck is on the line. I call this the hungry cats problem, which is like when I say to my kids, okay, kids, whose turn is it this month to feed the cats? Well, we're all going to feed the cats. We love the cats. I'm like, no, I need one name. <laughs> right. When everybody is in charge of feeding the cats, the cats go hungry. Because someone else is like, oh, I thought they were going to do it. And, you know, give someone, like create collaborations, but parse it in a way like, okay, who 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 owns this meeting? And for people to feel comfortable around this, I mean, so when you're giving somebody more room to to make decisions, right, to take action, um, it also means that you're you're introducing maybe the potential for, for more failure because it's, you're trying things that maybe you yourself aren't as confident about. You're letting them kind of go with it. What do you say to people around that? Is it, should they just welcome and just understand that's part of the process that you might encounter a little bit more, quote unquote, kind of failure or, you know, learning experiences, and that's going to ultimately make you stronger? Or is there something else they should be thinking about when they're kind of moving through that process? Well, okay. So I'm not a big fan of joint ownership. I think like, man, when that, when people jointly own it, that has to be a proven track record of we can jointly own something. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not a huge fan of like make mistakes, fail fast, fail forward. And I, I don't think that's a great business strategy actually. <laughs> so here's what I am a fan of is, is clear delineation and sizing things right. So I think one of the most powerful things you can do as an owner of a business is make it clear where it's okay to make mistakes and where it is not okay. Mm. See, every organization has uh, their freeways and their playgrounds. The freeways are like, you know what, you make a little mistake here and it's going to have severe consequences. That's what those doctors were talking about. Like sure. the three to 5% of the moments where it's like, I can't let someone experiment in this moment. I can't let someone debate this. I can't let someone else own it. Like mm -hmm. I have to be prescriptive. Like let people know this is a place where we have to get it exactly right. We have to follow procedure. We have a fiduciary responsibility. It has to be done. I might be a bit of a perfectionist and I need right. you to be a perfectionist. But there are not many organizations where like that's all they do. Most right. have what, what I call the playgrounds, which is mm -hmm. here's where you can try some things, you can make mistakes and you can recover from them. Okay. Like these are not business ending. They're not career yeah. ending. They're not life ending. Yeah. And these are our playgrounds. And, and when organizations can separate these, then people are like, okay, now I know where I can fail and recover and where I need to avoid failure at all costs. I'm, I really like that distinction. I'm glad that you, you share that because I think it actually gives a bit of like a, a breath of fresh air, a little bit of room to just kind of relaxed to once you create that separation or get clear about inside of your business, what is the playground or what areas are the playgrounds and you know, what areas are the highways? Um, I think that just creates my, so much yeah, more opportunity for alignment. Like here's a real practical example of this. I was going through that exercise with the executive team for banana Republic yep. and we're in their you know office in Manhattan. I remember, and we're going through and I did it with post-it notes and this is somewhere where you could do this with, you know, your, your business team is we said, okay, Two boards, not okay to fail, okay to fail. And we had everyone write their ideas down in post notes. We put it all up there and then we debated it. We're like, well, no, that's actually, you could fail at that and recover. And then people are like, oh no, you can't fail at that. So we get them all on the right board. It's all this kind of consensus. 
process. And then we step back and look at it. And it was so clear, this theme that emerged, like where it was not okay to fail. And it was so enlightening for people because it was almost like this, because it was kind of one word. Um, And I imagine people might be guessing, like, what would that be? Like, where could an organization like that, a clothing retailer, like not fail? And the word was December, (laughs) December, holiday. And, And it was kind of like this biblical decree of like, 11 months out of the year, thou mayest, you know, change product, try new promotions, you know, uh, do all these kinds of things, but do not screw up holiday. Right. And I guess that's because a big chunk of their business happens during that period of time. Right. A little, a little change, like introducing some crazy new product line, Mm -hmm. rearranging stores, changing the website with a new kind of shopping cart, like No, like you were not going to scare away (laughs) our customers at the time when we're bringing in the bulk of our profits and, you know, revenue. And so, of course, it's hugely liberating to the team. Like, oh, we can go back and tell people like, yeah, you can experiment, but just don't screw up. Now it's probably November and December, but every organization has it. That's the delineation. Mm. The other thing is, is getting the size right. And um, I don't mean the size of the khakis, like the size of the challenge. And I've, I've really come to see this as one of the, I think the master skills of good leaders is knowing how to size challenges, right? Sizing it right for your team. Like what's the hard thing you're asking people to do? Mm -hmm. And, and like, how do you give someone a challenge that's sized right for them? And I'd like to think of this um, as getting the the wave right. Now, it's a story that I share in the book, Multipliers, but this comes from um, my experience as a mother. And, you know, we've got three young kids. We're at the beach and our three-year-old, he's the youngest. You know, if this is an accident waiting to happen. There's like a near drowning waiting to happen because this kid is just drawn to the waves. This kid today is a surfer and <laughs> loves the ocean, but he would just keep going out into the big waves. And I'm trying to keep him to, you know, in the baby waves. And he keeps venturing out and I keep pulling him back in. People are laughing at us. It's like a comedy on the beach. And finally, I'm like, you know what? This kid is not going to learn this from his mom. Mm-hmm. Like I am failing at teaching him this. I'm like, he's going to have to learn this one from mother nature. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking now for the perfect wave, like the right size wave. And I need a wave that's big enough that it's going to toss him, but not so big that it's going to sweep him out to sea sure. and drown him. And so when that wave comes in, I step back and I just let him kind of toddle into it and it takes him and it like, it's tumbling him and I'm close by. And of course I'm getting some looks from other parents on the beach, which is like, whoa. And you know, my son's getting tumbled around in there. And then, you know, the wave kind of receives, I pull him up and then, you know, he's spitting out sand and a little surprised. And I'm like, okay, like Christian, let's talk about the power of the ocean. But like that needed the right size wave. Mm. And, you know, we do not want to let people just fail spectacularly. Yeah. But we also need to let people kind of toddle out into a wave that feels a little bit big for them. Right. But like just the way I'm looking for, I need one that creates a teaching moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but not a life ending moment. Mm-hmm. Like I think good leaders are looking for how do I give people something to own? That's just like big enough that it's going to really stretch them. They're going to learn, but not career ending and not business ending for me. And I think just sizing challenges, sizing, like how much failure it's about failure tolerance. Mm -hmm. Because people need to learn, but they, it can end, it can end something. No, I I think that's a a really good point. Definitely something for everybody to, to think about. I think one of these things that often to use the kind of the wave analogy again, just kind of gets swept away, right? It's all kind of gets lumped together. Um, And so spending some time to actually think about that distinction, you know, what size is the right size? How do we test something? What's a playground? What's a highway? How how do we kind of look at all those things? Um, There's so much that, I mean, like we've just literally scratched the surface in our conversation today. I really appreciate you for coming on. 
Um, and yeah, you know, I'd love to continue the conversation, but uh, I want to respect the time that we that we have. Where is the best place for people to go to learn more about you know about you, the Wiseman Group, all your books? Um, where should we send them? Well, uh, the Wiseman Group is thewisemangroup.com. Now, if you go to wisemangroup.com, you will find an interior design firm in San Francisco that I guarantee you has a much more interesting website. I, I was going to say that probably has gotten quite successful from all the business that you're sending their way when people type in the wrong the wrong URL. They, they send people to us. We've well, there sent you go. people to them. A good, they, a good strategic they alliance. <laughs> they stock um, my books at their headquarters because sometimes they end up sending them to people. We have a wonderful relationship. But um, yeah, the wisemangroup.com and there okay. there's information about what we do, but it, there's information about the books, resources. Um, yeah, we and- will, uh, we'll, we'll link all that up in the show notes. And is there any other resource or anything else you want to guide people towards you think might be helpful for consultants specifically or, or smaller firm owners? Well, there's something we didn't spend a lot of time talking about, but there is a resource there on the website. There's a little quiz. Are you an accidental diminisher? And what I will say about this, we we don't have the time to dig deeply into this, but let me scratch that surface is we find that most diminishing is not coming from bossy, know-it-all, narcissistic, you know, mega ego kinds of leaders. It's coming from what I call the accidental diminisher yeah. who is um, maybe like what I call the the idea, the fountain of ideas, or they're always on, or they're rescuing, or they're quick to respond, or they're pace setting for their team, or they're protecting their team, or like things that we do with the very best of intentions that look like good leadership that actually have deeply diminishing effects yeah. on others. There's a quiz there that yeah. um, that's something to probably go scratch on. Well, uh, perfect. We will link all that up in the show notes. Liz, again, thank you so much for coming on. Michael, it's absolutely my pleasure.